Good evening. Welcome to another episode of the PM Show. I'm so glad to have you guys here today on Freedomizer Radio with us. Uh, this is your host, Mandy Parsons. Our usual co-host, John Moreland, is taking a, a small hiatus, maybe for about the next month or so. He's decided to become a rodeo clown, so we're going to support him in his new career as a rodeo clown. Okay, I'm probably lying about that, but he's just taking some personal time, so we're just going to call it he's going to become a rodeo clown. But in his absence, I have the lovely and amazing Danica the Great with me once again, back for another round of this excellent two hours every Wednesday that we call the PM show because everybody wants her back. So here she is, Danica the Great. Hello. Hi, Mandy. Thanks for having me on. I'm very glad to be back. And, uh, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm not happy. I mean, I'm not happy. I mean, I'm, I'm happy that John's taking a hiatus. I think it's very, very important to take some personal time. Um, I certainly hope that he is well and that um, he does get things taken care of. Um, I'm happy that I had the opportunity to um, co-host with you. That that has um, opened that opportunity. So thanks for having me back. Hey, you are always welcome here. You have a lot of people who like you. Um, who have listened to the show, and as I understand, a lot of people at the network have also added you as a friend, and they have befriended you because they've heard you on the show. So it's it's opening up doors yes. for you and bringing you new friends, and it's improving our show. I think it's always important to have a different point of view. So having you on gives me a different point of view than John's, and in about, I think, 15 minutes, um, Ken the Liberty Phoenix will be joining us as well. Oh, so awesome. it'll just be a nice... What are you saying, awesome? And then what were you going to say? <laughs> oh, I was going to say awesome. He's good people. He is good people. I I agree with you. I might be a little biased on that, but he is good people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to have another nice two hours of voluntarist slash anarchy talk with a bunch of great people who know what they're talking about. And um, I will share some good news with everybody really quickly, and then we'll jump into the show itself. Um, but... I found out today that after two, one and a half years probably of a long job hunt and search, I am officially a fifth grade teacher here in the state of Georgia. Yay! <laughs> so excited. I cannot wait. I get to meet my kiddos for the first time tomorrow. School here starts next Tuesday. So we start uber early, and uh, I can't wait to change the lives of a bunch of children. That's awesome. Now I wanted to ask. Uh, I mean, it's it's still July. I mean, I you know I've been seeing all this. You know, get back to school already. Like in the early part of July, and I was just like, seriously. Like most public schools just got out. How in the world are you already trying to get people to get ready to go back to school? So it's just. I mean, it's just it's strange to me seeing you start school that early, but. I mean, I'm, you know, early for me, I guess, is like mid-August, which quite a number of schools do. But, I mean, each district is different, I suppose. Um, down here in the south, there are many districts who start early. Most of the school districts in Georgia start about next week, um, August 5th, August 6th there is the official start date. And we get out, though, uh, when did we get out? Our last day of school was May 23rd. Yeah. That's oh, okay, yeah. The first, yeah, so we got out May 23rd, and teachers started coming back to work this week. And it was a last-minute hire for me. They had the position filled, but the woman got a higher position in, in another school district. And so they were looking, and the whole interview was weird. It was like I got there 15 minutes early. Um, the interview was 15 minutes late, and then the whole interview was only 15 minutes. So wow, 15 I, is your lucky number now, lady. Must be. And I was just like, huh. Okay, 15-minute interview is usually not good because it's usually like, okay, yeah, well, thank you. Um, but no, she called me today with a few more questions, and I was interviewed by the entire assistant principal board. They were listening to my answers. They weren't asking me any questions. But right after the interview was over, she offered me the position. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, that ha that uh, happened to me with my – I was actually going to let you know about this in the messages when we were talking to each other earlier today, but uh, I want to tell you that a short interview is not necessarily all that bad either because when I just recently gained employment myself, and the interview itself probably took about 15 minutes, 15 minutes as well, and I was hired on the spot at the same interviewer. So, 
you know, I just want to let you know that, hey, you know, it's uh, not necessarily a bad thing. No, it's not. I have had a an interview previously that was really, really short, but the lady scratched off like half the questions on the list. And then when I inquired about whether or not I got hired, I actually sent her an email because a lot of employers these days are not very good about getting back with you concerning whether or not you got the position. And I'm not assuming that every single employer should email every single applicant. I mean, nobody has time for that. I understand. But if you hey, nobody got somebody, time for that. <laughs> exactly. If you throw someone an interview, though, and you actually choose to interview them, you owe them an answer either way. You do. And, you know, as you and I both know, and we've been doing the job search, that it's super frustrating not hearing back. And it's up to us, the interviewees, to send some sort of, like, thank you letter to let them know that we appreciate their time, which I certainly understand business protocol and stuff. But it's just, you know, we also deserve at least be told, hey, you know, thank you for applying. You unfortunately did not get the job. It can be an email. It can be a simple phone call, whatever. It's your job to not keep us hanging. It's, it's extremely rude. And if I were a recruiter, I would never do that to any of my applicants. Do you know that two of the people I interviewed just to check on the status of my interview, they actually just never even responded to my email? Wow. Yeah. Then the one of them was the first 15-minute interview that I had had. It was extremely short. I guess that interview was more like 20 minutes, but um, she just, I have no idea. But when you email somebody, at least have the courtesy to reply back. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah that's, so that's after super that, frustrating. After that, you just have to let it go, and you kind of have to assume at that point that it's just not going to happen. Mm-hmm. Yes, and we do have a caller waiting to talk. I'm going to pull the caller in um, because sure. Ken has not called in yet, but I, I have a feeling I know who it is. Oh, wait, no, they're not asking to talk. They're just listening. So, hello, I know oh, who okay. you are. I'm glad you're listening. Thank you. Okay, so um, I posted a lot of stuff. No, he's he's now saying hello. Hold on just a second. Hello? Hi, it's a secret admirer, but it's not so secret. So I guess I'm not a secret admirer anymore, am I? You're just an admirer. Oh, you'll oh, always be a secret admirer to me in my mind. <laughs> Hi, Hi. This, this, it's our good friend Larry. Larry, I'm glad that you're back. Doing great, Larry. Yeah, Thanks for coming even, on. Even though I'm not an anarchist? Yeah, I mean, the person you usually argue with is on a hiatus. He's now decided he wants to be a rodeo clown. That's the story I made up, but I'm sticking oh, with it. Tell the, well, you're just covering for him because he's really a circuit clown. Ha-ha. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? Well, no, it's good that we have it. an opposing view from an anarchist because the mean of anarchy is to just pretty much do what you feel is best for you, for you. So if you feel that you are not meant to be an anarchist, then then fine, I am okay with that. Yeah. Well, Mandy knows I'm very much a strict constitutionalist. Mhm. Yes, I, yes. But it, it's based on the fact that we don't live in a perfect world. And there are bad people that won't behave in an anarchy. And they'll take sure. what you have, you know. Sure. And it, but anyway, if the world didn't have bad people, anarchy would be great. I can't disagree well, with that. But, I'll tell you, know, you Barry, we don't live due, in that world. Yes. What, with all due respect, with all due respect with what you're saying, the when I chose to take the anarchist viewpoint, and I really it resonated with me. That was one of my biggest concerns. You know, I asked my friends, "How do you regulate?" A society like that, because regardless of whether or not you think it should be stateless, it still has to have regulations somewhere, somehow. Yeah. What do what do you do when somebody does something like that? So I came across a voluntarist wiki page actually that said, in a society where you have to punish somebody, you come together with people who were affected by that crime or that issue, and you talk about the best way that you all feel as a as a united group how to handle that issue. Should that person be punished? If so, how should they be punished? What do you agree upon? So they do yeah, have standards. What if it's a group? What if it's an entity or a group that's larger than your group and you're not powerful enough to stop them or punish them? Okay. Um good question because I uh you know, I wonder this sometimes myself when uh these kind of circumstances pull up. Can you Provide an example that I, I can um, better maybe make an analogy for. Okay, let's say, and really, you know, being, <coughs> excuse me, 
with anarchy, it's a thing about individuality. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, if it's absolute true anarchy, that's one thing. Then, if it's a moderate anarchy where you have individuality, but you have a group of people to, that work together that you know have a kind of loosely knit, for lack of a better term, governmental body, if you will, that have some minor rules set in place. Okay, which you have to be really careful about calling it anarchy because then you start getting close to that word constitution. But anyway, uh, you have like this small government, if you will, and then somebody next door, 100 miles away, has a bigger group of a governmental body and they don't believe in live and let live. They want what you have. And there are no overseers to make that group behave. Now, in the original Articles of Confederation, you had a loosely knit group of states that were bound by an agreement. There was just no agreement to make any kind of army in the time of a crisis, which is what brought about a more federalistic form of government, but still obeying or protecting the Bill of Rights that believe that there are certain unalienable rights that cannot be taken away, period. Now, and if you read the full Constitution, Bill of Rights, Declaration of Independence, the whole work, okay? And everything in there was just a little bit left of anarchy. Even with the corporate form of the Constitution, it protected an individual where an anarchy would, okay? Now, do I agree with the uh, full-blown constitution? No, because they kind of slipped in, well, we can tax you, whether you like it or not. But Mm -hmm. what protected you from that, though, if, and it's a big if, unfortunately, because of the human nature, if the people of the republic weren't in the doldrums of apathy, you would never get taxed in a bad way, okay? Uh, Because, and here's the catch. Everybody, according to the Constitution, you didn't have a duty to join an army because it was unconstitutional to have a standing army. You had a duty to be part of a state militia, not a federal government militia, okay? Okay? a militia of every community that in the times of trouble you would get up off your butt and take part in putting down like for example let's say after the colonies beat the Brits back, okay? You had the obligation just in case there were loyalists that decided, no, we weren't going to tolerate it. They rose up. Well, the militia would take up arms and say, you don't like it, go to England. Otherwise, get back to your homes and shut up. And at the point of a gun. That protected people. But unfortunately, the people didn't make the loyalists leave And the loyalists were smart enough to realize at the point of a gun they were going to lose. So they realized that infiltration and over a period of decades and generations, usurpation would be a better way to do things. But I'm digressing away from the anarchy part. But the thing is, anarchy, while... In a perfect world and under ideal circumstances would be the best way to go. We have bad people in the world, not just in government, but the problem is those bad people rise to the surface 
because good people do nothing to stop the bad, okay? Because a lot of times good people do have the philosophy of live and let live, and I want to just go do my own thing. And I really didn't start this to go into a long tirade or speech or whatever, and I'm kind of going on, and I apologize. But oh, no, no, that's perfectly fine, Larry. Um, I, you know, I know these just, questions are are to really discuss, so I, I appreciate going, it. But. Yeah, you <laughs> kind of got me going on something, because I, I really was going to leave it brief, but then you kind of asked me a question about something, and it's like, well, it's not really as simple as people make it out, because there are a lot of things, and, and a lot of people, and I don't expect people to read the Constitution from page to page, you know, normally, but when mm-hmm. people do say, anarchy is the best, well, yes and no. I mean, it is in the ideal paradise, but in the world that we live in, it's not, because we live in a bunch of, we live in a world with a bunch of jerks that <clears throat> are downright evil. Not just in politics. I mean, you know, like my house got broke broke into by a bunch of meth heads while I was gone. Okay. Oh wow. And, well, I'm, you know, I'm not looking for sympathy. I'm just using it as an example. Okay. Mhm. But they stripped it bare. I mean, they took out copper wiring, uh, copper pipe. You know, I mean, just, I mean, everything. They took food. Uh, they threw food on the floor. I mean. It, You know, they were downright evil people. They took, to give you an example of evilness, they took a painting off the wall and just smashed it. They didn't have the brains to realize it was valuable. It was a numbered print. It wasn't really an actual painting. It was a numbered print, okay? Oh. But it was still collectible, all right? But anyway, I mean, they were stupid. They did it just to be evil, all right? They didn't do it to, I mean, it wasn't for money. It was to... It was just for her, to her harm someone on an emotional level, okay? I mean, that's the kind of world we live in. Those kind of people exist. And it wasn't just one person. There were at least two, if not three, maybe four people doing this. And I know this because they lifted up off the ground, unbolted first, off its foundation of concrete, the air conditioner heat pump unit, and it was a three-ton unit. Those are not small. Those are pretty heavy, okay? And uh, uh, just certain things that they did took more than one or two people. Or And <clears throat> I just, I don't see it being two people. Uh, it's just, just everything, from the way it looked, it was uh, more than one or two. But it was obvious. The, the a very, it was obvious a very big group effort. Well, at least uh, two or three. Yeah, uh, it depends on what you call big group. But you know, and I've seen this in other places in the world where, like in Africa, you get a large group of people together, and they go and kill Christians, and the Christians are just wanting to live and let live. Or in the Middle East, where there are a group of Christians being slaughtered, and they want to be, live in like, Turkey is a good example. The Armenians are real peaceful people. They don't go and make wars on other people. They just want to live and be left alone. And so far to date, over 10 million Armenians that were Christian have been murdered by the Turks that were Muslim. Okay? That's where just, you know, oh. anarchy doesn't work. Hey, Larry, we do need to go to a commercial yes, break. As, That's cool. As always, well, I it do. is your show, you I, know. Oh, I know, and I do appreciate you calling in, as always. It's good to hear from you again. So we're going to go to a commercial break, okay. and then I think when we get back, Danica wanted to talk about the events going on in the Middle East. So we will be back well, yes. right after be my guest. a few messages. I am an autonomous government agent here to steal your livelihood. Not so fast. I'm Sovereign Filing Solutions. And I'm the Sovereign. We're teamed up. To bring you... The truth without censorship. Are you tired of being fed multi-million dollar media lies? Are you ready for the real story? Sovereign Filing Solutions has teamed up with the Sovereign Newspaper to make sure you get it. 
and not the BS this guy behind me wants to feed you. Take the step, help make the change. Oh, come on, that's not even fair. How are we supposed to rule indiscriminately if you know what's going on? There is a new program on the Freedomizer Network, Bloody Beak Radio, punching the new world order in the nose. Bloody Beak Radio is here to inform you on a wide variety of topics revolving around current and recent events. The main thrust of the show is not just to inform you of the problems we face, but rather, how do we analyze them in a way that we can use to create counter-propaganda and use that knowledge in our everyday lives. In a sense, how do we market the truth? Bloody Beak Radio will give you the tools to win the information war so we can destroy the barriers that divide the people and have a peaceful revolution. Join your host, Kyle Baker, on Sunday evenings to have an honest discussion about how to win the numbers game and ensure that we decide the tempting point, not them. Please listen to me on Freedom Talk with Cindy Lake at 5 o'clock Pacific Standard Time, 8 o'clock Eastern Standard Time on FreedomizerRadio.com. All the issues that are important to you, like Common Core, Gender 21, Fully Informed Jury Association, 10th Amendment, 2nd Amendment, 4th Amendment, 3rd Amendment, the Constitution, see you at FreedomizerRadio.com, 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. See you there. Greetings. This is Blake the Eccentric, and I want to invite you to check out my new show on Freedomizer Radio, The Eccentric Perspective. It's sort of a red pill, blue pill, going down the rabbit hole kind of show, featuring outside-the-box politics, philosophy, and gonzo journalism. But be warned, with knowledge comes responsibility, and you might not see the world the same way again as I will attempt to open your mind, speak to your common sense, and challenge your critical thinking skills. So please join me Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday from noon to 1.30 Pacific Time. Once again, that's Eccentric Perspective, only on Freedomizer Radio. Are you dedicated to ending the new world order? Well, it's time to make way for spontaneous order. Hi, I'm Eric Bell, host of Freedomizer Radio's new hit show, For Whom the Bell Tolls, where you will hear current events from a volunteer's perspective, philosophical libertarianism, and a roadmap to a free and stateless society. Tune in every Tuesday at 3 to 5 p.m. Pacific and 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern. And we're back. I have Danica with me here again. I'm here. Thank you so much. You are so welcome. And I just want to remind everybody that you can come join us in the chat room at freedomizerradio.com. There's a little little link off to the side, a little tab that says chat room. Please click on it, create a name, and come join us. Um, Also, if you don't get the whole show tonight or you don't get to listen to the show on Wednesdays, you can always go to YouTube. And you can watch us on the Voluntary Virtues Network, or rather listen to us because we're not doing a camera, but you don't ever have to miss our show. And if it's on YouTube, that means if you can't watch it on Thursday or listen to it Thursday, that you can always pull it up and listen to us. But we do appreciate our listeners both on Voluntary Virtues and on Freedomizer. And if you want to call in and just talk, then please feel free to call in. The guest line is 347-324-3704. And I just got a, a message from Liberty Phoenix and I'm going to bring him in. So let me add him to the group. Okay. Do I have Ken the Liberty Phoenix on the air with me? How are you doing, ladies? Hey. Okay. Yeah. Hey, so Ken. we have Ken the Liberty Phoenix. And we have Danica the Great. It's another week party. Woohoo! <laughs> So we have talked about our new jobs. Danica just started a new job this week. I'll be starting my new job tomorrow. And we talked about the downfall of anarchy and why Larry doesn't think anarchy will work. And so now Danica wanted to talk a little bit about the conflicts going on in the Middle East. So, Danica, what did you want to talk about about the Middle East? Well, all right. So, I mean, 
this has obviously been thrown out the um, on the news feeds in the last several weeks about uh, who who's in the wrong here. Is it Hamas um, using children as human shields? Is it Israel throwing bombs and refusing to come to some sort of peace agreement? It's just it's everywhere and it's extremely depressing. Um, I know uh, I know Ken is very familiar with antiwar.com. I actually had the opportunity at Porkfest to talk to Angela Keaton of antiwar.com. Uh, great lady. Uh, I love what she's doing uh, in the movement right now. Now, there was a news article I brought up from antiwar.com about Israel defending another UN school uh, that was full of res- refugees in Gaza. They uh, they did bomb one of the uh, thir- they did bomb a third school in Gaza. Nineteen children have been killed. So, I mean, really, I wanted to kind of discuss with you and Ken. Uh, What's I mean, obviously what's going on in the Middle East is definitely years and years of religious conflict. Um, we know that the Israels made the state after World War II uh, that they feel that this is their homeland, but also the Palestinians feel that it's their home too, and it's just they're fighting over it. There's been constant war, um, if not a cold war, over there. I you know don't necessarily think either side is in the right. I, I definitely don't agree that Hamas uh, is doing is doing what they should be doing to try and promote peace. They are a terrorist group. They do use children as human shields. Uh, yet Israel is throwing bombs over at them too, which is not not what we need to try and do to achieve peace. So there's tons of articles from antiwar.com that I wanted to share. Um, I wanted to get uh, your your kind of opinion about what you know. Why do you think this is going on? What do you think would be the best way to try and come to a resolution? Bombs for Jesus, baby. Bombs for Jesus. <laughs> No, okay, I'm just kidding about that. Don't anybody get their panties in the water over that. But um, I think, first of all, didn't I read an article maybe sometime last year that said that according to the United Nations, PALS now considered its own entity? Yes, PALS has been that, lobbying for uh, its own entity for a while. Not that we follow the United Nations. We have a lot of animosity towards the United Nations and think that we just need to get rid of the United Nations or withdraw from the United Nations. But as far as a global entity, the United Nations has a lot of hold on things. And according to what I read last year, they recognize Palestine as its own entity. So Palestine should have the representation. I think that um, it's a power struggle. It's obviously a power struggle, but how in the world can you do this in the name of a religion? I am so sick and tired of people who claim a religion and then claim that their religion is right, that they're going to do it, and that their religious entity says that this is what needs to be done. That this because is under the guise of religion, you have sociopaths and psychopaths that take the authority and tell people that you know religion gives people this. this this legitimate this this view that you know you can legitimately kill people because it's in the name of God, and right. it's just another you know distraction, another way for them to control each other. Um, this is the way that they're doing it. Both both of them, Hamas and the uh, the IDF, are both extremists in my view. Um, the only people that are you know anywhere near innocent in this entire conflict are the children under five years old. Because I think those are the only ones that don't have guns thrust in their hands. And, from the moment that they're born, um, mm-hmm. there's no real way to to solve it at this point. Um, it's short of separating the two. I mean, it's it's a couple of bullies going at it, um, and you know, what are you doing in your classrooms when that happens? You just got to separate them. But how do you actually separate these people who have been fighting over this territory for thousands of years? Um, you know, what do you what do you have? Some some international. Uh, Tribunal come in and and tell them, okay you guys go over to your corner and you guys go over to your corner and no more fighting for like five years stop it right they're sitting in a in a virtual timeout yeah there's there's no way there's no way to, to accomplish that well my first question honestly about all of this why is the United States even involved in this I understand that they that Israel is supposed allies with the U S so we're supposed to be supporting them on this but it, it's tyranny is what it is. I mean, the reports that are coming out, you have some people who are reporting, yes, Israel has a right to do this. And then you have um, other entities that are saying, oh, yes, well, uh, Palestine should fight back. Uh, ultimately, 
no country should ultimately ally themselves with anybody. They shouldn't align themselves with anybody. We should have nothing to do with this. This should not be news in our country. They mm-hmm. need th- this United, the United States. The U.S. government, the U.S. military. Fair That's enough. not my military. I'm Fair enough. Well, Fair enough. No, we well. don't need to get into that. That's okay. Um, but, yes, the U.S. government, it's not – I don't want to have. I don't want this to be broadcasted. I like the news reporting this. I don't. I don't think that we there should be anything outside of the Middle East about this. It's not our business. It's certainly not the people of the United States' business. But the U.S. government's insisting it's it's their issue. Well, it is our business because our tax dollars are going to fund both sides of that conflict. I mean, the money that they steal from us is going to buy bombs and rockets to pay to get to Hamas and. Air, you know, freaking F F sixteen fighters and tanks to go to to Israel. That's true. So we're we're just funneling all this stuff in there, and well, there we go again. Uh, the the U S government is funneling all this money in there, and you no know, nobody seems to want to stop it at the at the higher up levels. So we're already invested in that situation. And what's what's the solution? Somebody has to it's convince actually funny the U S government to stop giving them money. It's actually funny that you mentioned that, Ken, because I had an article from Reddit. Uh, it was from The Daily Show that someone submitted. Uh, and the headline is, Pay your taxes so our country can keep sending weapons and bombs to both sides of conflicts in the Middle East. Um, I've not viewed the video myself. Um, I was just looking at it just right before the show started for show prep. So I thought that was pretty interesting that people have – some sort of mindset about d- trying to stop funding the war, and the, you know, I guess the simplest way to do it is to just simply not pay your taxes. It, thankfully, I live in an area where there aren't many taxes uh, imposed on me. The ones that are are imposed mostly in restaurants and property taxes. So, the taxes that I pay when I pay rent uh, or when I go out to eat, unfortunately, goes to that tax dollars. It's certainly frustrating, and I'm just wondering, you know, how is there a way that we can, you know, stop funding this war? Is it just to stop paying taxes? Um, I doubt it, because even without the tax money that they steal from us, um, they'll just print the money to buy the bombs. That's so, I mean, true. That's and inflation I mean, our, our, if we stop paying taxes, um, it's going to take a massive movement of it at, you know, over a, a, a you know a short period of time, for it to actually make a dent and actually c- collapse this federal government, because that's the only thing that's going to stop it is, is if the federal government collapses. Otherwise, they're just going to keep spending money and keep printing it and so forth. I mean, supposedly Janet Yellen is going to start to taper here in uh, in August or September, supposedly. But the only thing that's ever going to stop all this is if the the federal government collapses and stops stealing money from people and stops having their hand on a printing press. That seems to be the only way a lot of things are going to happen is if the government collapses and we're waiting for that. You know, a number of us, even even Ron Paul said that with our current government, nothing is going to get accomplished. He said they're worthless. There's no turning back at this point. They can't improve. They can't get better. The only thing we can do is destroy it and start from the from the bottom up again. Absolutely agree. You know, back when the you know back when the economy meltdown was going on in 2008, 2009, uh, myself and many people were trying to say, you know, let the economy crash, let the government crash, let's then let's rebuild it up because that's how we're going to get through with this. And you know, unfortunately, it did not really happen. Do you feel like this conflict going on between? the Israelis and the Palestinians, do you feel like this is just more distraction to keep our eyes off of what's going on right in this country? I really think so. I think we really need to concentrate on the problems that's going on within our nation rather than butt our noses somewhere else. I mean, you know, there's a saying they say, those that do not learn history are doomed to repeat it. You know, let's look at Vietnam. That's a classic example. Let's look at the war in Iraq. You know, why are we so willing to try and get ourselves involved with other nations? Yes, we want to help as much as we can, but the best thing that we can do is just let it sort out on our own. That's none of our business. We don't know because their the ways. We don't know their progress. The, federal, the powers that control the federal government want the wars to continue to happen. And that's they don't care what the House of Representatives says. They don't care what the Senate says. They don't care what the president says. They don't care what the judicial branch says. And they certainly don't give a flying care 
as to what the average American citizen thinks. Um, there, are even there's even the slaves at the highest level of the hierarchy of this prison. Their opinions don't matter when it comes to the wars. The wars will continue because they have the money and they want them to. They have the ability. If they can, they are. Period. So until the the, the powers that be that control um, the levers of well, the levers of, of society, these wars are never going to stop. And I don't think they're going to stop either. These people have been fighting for years. They're fighting for years. While we're, but while our eyes are directed over there into what's going on in a conflict that we shouldn't even have to choose sides, but people I know are choosing sides saying support this, support that, uh, there's stuff going on in our own country. And I do think that the media focuses on these things just as a deterrent to keep us focused on elsewhere so they can push an agenda through here in the States. You're absolutely right about that. There is an article from antiwar.com, another one that I wanted to share about. Congress warns Obama not to push Israel for ceasefire. So efforts to negotiate a ceasefire in Israel's ongoing invasion of the Gaza Strip aren't sitting well with Israeli hawks. And by extension, that means they aren't sitting well with the U.S. Congress. So that's got congressional officials up in arms, pushing President Obama to stop trying to negotiate a ceasefire in the conflict and instead to endorse Israel's war unconditionally, irrespective of how bad it gets. Of course. Uh, just, as I already said, they want the war to keep keep going. They don't care who dies. But it, how do we fix it? We can't. We don't have the power. The only thing that we can do as individuals is to remove our consent from the system. Generally means going to jail. Unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about the elusive so called great leader of this country, the United the United States. Um, so the Obama family, and I'll tell you why I'm, I'm discussing this, but the Obama family is set to buy a $4.25 million desert home in California. Okay, and I, and I got this from the Washington Times. And the only thing that came to mind after reading this is how much of the money they're using to purchase that home is coming from people's, from people's taxes. What do you think? Oh, absolutely. I mean, they have they have no business buying a home in California. Why do they need to go to California? Why, you know, why why are they not able to go back to their home their home state of Illinois in Chicago when the presidency? Oh, no, they can go to they can go to California. They don't need to come back here. <laughs> well, don't do that to me. Remember too, California is also a very liberal state. They would embrace him quite nicely. Um, but I'm listening, this house, I'm listening to, uh, not listening, reading the description of this house. The four-bedroom, four-and-a-half bathroom structure has its own two-story waterfall, a golf putting green, and a master retreat with a gym, tanning salon, and private spa, according to Realer, uh, Realtor.com. It includes elevators, a private rock-formed lagoon, and a misting system with, to help with the heat. Okay, it also includes a casita with three bedrooms and three baths and spans 3.29 private acres. Um, and so they, you know, wasn't the report that they were just looking for a home in Asheville, North Carolina, not too long ago? Yes, yes, there was. I do remember that report. Okay, so now they've, like I said, they've switched their attention over to California, and this actually is close. They spent... Father's Day weekend in Coachella Valley, and they stayed at a home in the same Thunderbird Heights neighborhood. So the White House press secretary, Josh Ernest, said that the report was not accurate, but who knows with these jokers? And like I said, the only thing I could think about was, and I wonder how many tax dollars they're funneling out to pay for their new home. Well, didn't didn't they say that the average wage of a president's like, 400,000 or something, and now they get a stipend after they retire from being president for the rest of their life? Possibly so. I know back in the 80s, the president earned $250,000 a year, and so I'm sure that they've raised that exponentially since the 80s since everything else has gotten more expensive, or maybe everything stays the same price for the president and inflation only happens to the little people. 
Well, I'm wondering with the with the price, it probably uh, with inflation, it probably has gotten closer to the four hundred thousand since these for sure. Probably so, but you know that even earning a stipend like that, they're going to live wherever they want. They're going to get done whatever they want. Well, regardless of the stipend, I mean, the the money that the president makes as president is nothing compared to the money he makes as endorsement. It's like being a being a professional uh, sports athlete. The money you make with your contract is nothing. You want the you want the endorsement deals. You want your your Halliburton deals. You want your your uh, uh, your KBR deals. You want your defense contractor deals to 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 throw you a few hundred thousand here, a few million there, and you stick that in an offshore account. And then you you as you show yourself, oh, I've got this small little amount of money. This is all I'm living on. You know, this we have to spend you know two hundred and fifty thousand dollars on all of our butlers and so forth. We're just barely scraping by. We're just like you, America. And then once you get out of the office, it's hey, look at this. I found sixteen million dollars stashed away in some account. Look at that. So the money that they get that they make this present is nothing. And the majority of that other stuff is technically under this, you know, injustice system legal. So they don't have to worry about it. Well, I will I will switch gears here and I I pulled up another article also. One of my friends posted this. I don't remember who posted it. Their comments were, were funny. Um apparently and this comes from a publication called Quartz. It's on the internet. It it concerns the price of fast food and they interviewed a woman and apparently she said, I've worked at McDonalds for ten years and still make seven dollars and thirty five cents an hour. And it says that um Sherry Delisline is a 27-year-old mother of four from Charleston, South Carolina. And she is holding up a sign, or somebody's holding up a sign that says $15. Now, my friend's response to this is, if you are working at a fast food restaurant for 10 years and you're only making $7.35 an hour, that's a, that's a personal decision and it's a poor decision. The fact that you've worked there for 10 years and only make 735 is no one's fault but your own because you haven't sought a lifestyle change. Exactly. Anybody that works in a fast food chain, if you're not a manager within like two, three years, you need to find somewhere else. That's obviously not your role. Like you're not supposed to sit there forever and, and be, you know, you, you don't want to have that be your first and your last job. I don't want to be 85 years old standing outside leaning out the uh, the drive through windshield. Would you like fries with that, Sonny? That's not where you want to end up. <laughs> well, here's my question. What if you're moving up the ladder at said fast food restaurant, though? If you're moving up the ladder at said fast food, then you're not making $7 an hour. If you're staying at $7 an hour, that means that you either don't want to move up or you're doing something that prevents you from moving up. I mean, that's just, that's just how it is. You know, you're going to stay put if you don't move up. And most people, and when I say most people, I'm going to, I'm going to, I mean, I've, I've only worked in fast food. Uh, it was my very first job at 16 and obviously it didn't last very long because I moved on to other things. But generally speaking, I'd say about 90% of people that go into fast food go uh, go up to different roles. Like they become assistant manager, shift manager, shift supervisor, um, store manager. I mean, the movement of fast food is pretty pretty significant. So, you know, I'm sure there's something this lady is not telling us. Either she just she just refuses to go up or she's doing something that keeps her wage where it's at. I mean, I agree with your friends that it's definitely a very um, – personal choice and a very poor choice. I've got a cousin of mine that started out flipping, flipping burgers, and she is she spent, I think, three years you know, working as a crew man, member, um, and she was a, a manager, skipped assistant manager. She went on to their uh, elite management program to the, the college, and she now works in the corporate offices, making like 130000 a year. I mean, there's, there's room for improvement. She's, I think she's only been there 15 years. Um, so there's no excuse for that. That's that's the, the own, her own fault that she allowed herself to not sell and not perfect her own personal abilities to make the owners see what type of an asset she is. She's obviously not worth anything else, otherwise she'd have gotten it. Well, you know, when I was working 
in management for a major international food and beverage company, we would have teenagers come in and apply for jobs all the time. And where I worked was actually a little different. They didn't want anybody. I think they had to be 16 or older. They wouldn't hire anybody below 16. Um, But they were always, the parents were always complaining. My child is 16 and can't get a summer job. No one will hire anybody anymore for just a summer job. Why is that? And at first, you know, I do feel sympathy for these kids. I feel sympathy for the parents who are, are trying to teach their children how to earn and how good it feels to earn your own dollar and to manage your money and to live your life and to grow up, et cetera, et cetera. But when you have women like this who have been serving in a fast food position for 10 years earning seven thirty-five an hour, especially in this economy, the reason that you can't find a summer job is because they have to retain these adults who will take any job they can because the economy sucks and they need a job. Yeah, and if I'm a manager of a, uh, of, a of a McDonald's and I've got a 16 year old kid applying for a position to be a you know, a fry hopper, and I've got a 34 year old single mother applying, the 34 year old single mother gets it before the 16 year old. She obviously has a kid to feed. So sorry, sorry, Shorty. But see, in this kind of society and what we believe you're allowed to do that. I mean, if it's if it's a private business especially, you can do that. There's nothing saying you have to hire a 16-year-old. And I would hope that the single mother would be finding a different job if she could because that's not going to make ends meet for her. But also these people who are saying, oh, we deserve $15 an hour. There was a city outside of Seattle who they raised the minimum wage up to $15 an hour. What they didn't realize is all the perks that they were getting in addition to working for minimum wage they no longer had. So they no longer got vacation, a paid vacation. They no longer got retirement. They no longer got 401Ks. They no longer got so many perks they were getting, free parking even. It went away because these people demanded $15 an hour. So they got their $15 an hour, and they were told, you wanted a higher wage, you got it. We can't afford now to pay you all these extra perks that you were getting. People don't understand that this money doesn't just come out of nowhere. Before a business makes the decision to raise the minimum wage or the state make, to uh, hire people under a new minimum wage, what they don't understand is either the food costs are going to go up and the cost of living is going to go up, or these people are going to lose their jobs because the business has to offset being able to pay these higher wages. Yeah, they don't understand that if one thing rises, such as, say, the minimum wage, let's just say, like, one nation or one state raises minimum wage to $15 an hour. Costs are going to go up. You pay $8. Let's just say, you know, you pay $8 for a state, correct? So, you know, you make now $15 an hour. You're like, oh, I can now afford all the things I haven't been able to afford. Well, that eight dollar that eight dollar a pound steak is now a fifteen dollar per pound steak. So, you know, now it costs five dollars to ride the bus instead of say two fifty to ride the bus. Like things are going to go up. So, your minimum wage may increase, but so will things around you. So, you know, if you're stuck not making a very good wage, things are just going to keep increasing if they keep increasing the minimum wage. Well, it says right here that the median median wage is $8.94 with an average of only 24 hours a week. Okay, that means people are making much less. And fast food CEOs, meanwhile, are living large. I am so sick and tired of these people complaining how much CEOs are making. Okay, they worked hard to move up the ladder. They worked hard to get where they are. We some, should, of some of them, thank you. We have not... We shouldn't discount these fools' hard work, the people who worked hard to get there, just because they're making a ton of money as a CEO. If you have to manage an international company and you have to travel all the time and you're in charge of several states and you're in charge of several stores in several states, yeah, your job load is a lot more. I'm sorry, but somebody who's flipping burgers should not be comparing themselves to the CEOs. And this article makes me mad because they twist it around to make the CEOs sound like bad people because they're earning a lot of money. Not every not every CEO, I think, is an evil person, but I'm sure that once you're put in that spot, you ha- you're going to become an evil person uh, if 
Davi Barker's book, Authoritarian Sociopathy, has shown us anything. It's that human nature is adapted, which means that humans are neither evil nor good. Um, we have the propensity for both, and we will adapt to whatever situation um, fosters that kind of an attitude. If, if we're in a, if we have, if I have a position as a CEO, and I'm encouraged to cut wages and 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 you know to 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 increase the bottom line by sacrificing the the, the lower man, then that's what you're going to do if you're in a position as a CEO where you're actually incentivized to take care of the people that work for you, um, then that's generally what men would do. So it all depends on the company that you're working for, I think, you know. And I, I cannot stand unbiased, um, excuse me, biased articles. This is a one-sided article. The more I read this, I realize how one-sided it is. They're talking about how more than half of fast food workers are on public assistance, costing taxpayers $7 billion a year. They said, all, just look at what's happened this year. All 13 states that raised their minimum wage in 2014 have had stronger employment growth than the 37 states, according to a recent report. Retailers like Gap, who raised wages, say they are already seeing benefits, too. And I'm calling BS on this article. I'm totally calling BS on this article because a true, balanced article would discuss the pros and cons. This is just talking about how if you want to get people off of minimum wage or you want to get people off of um, benefits, public assistance, we need to raise the minimum wage. And these states who are saying that they've had employment growth, I don't see how that's possible when you probably have to fire more people to justify raising pay for a few. Well, it doesn't. They're, these people are asking for the roads to be slit, basically. They, they don't even know what they're, what they're saying because all they hear is, give me more money, give me more money from the government, not, not knowing anything at all about where it's coming from or what's happening. Uh, it's, they're doing exactly what they've been programmed to do. Exactly. And I'll tell you what, it is time to go to a commercial break. And when we get back, uh, Ken is the Liberty Phoenix. I actually want you to tell us your story of what recently happened to you and your encounter with the cops, the local cops where you live. So, oh, yes. Right. I want to hear that. Yeah, it is a very, very interesting, fascinating story that I actually got to somewhat witness. So we're going to go to a commercial break, and we'll talk about it after these messages. Want to spread awareness to your neighbors, family, and friends about what is going on in our country today? It may be things you already know, like the large number of FEMA camps spread around this country to lock up citizens like you and me. What legislators are doing to strip states and people of their sovereign rights. Or legislation giving states the power to force vaccinate under a declared state of emergency. Do your neighbors understand what is going on? William Lewis Films offers the perfect tools to inform our population about this government's tyrannical shift from a constitutional republic to a despotic democracy. Films like 911 Ripple Effect, Beyond Treason, One Nation Under Siege, Washington You're Fired, Camp FEMA, Enemy of the State, Don't Tread on Me, Blood of Patriots, The Ron Paul Uprising, even 911 in plain sight, William's first production, are all available at WilliamLewisFilms.com. Get your DVDs today at WilliamLewisFilms.com. Educate against the police state. Hello, everyone. Proof is here. I want to let you know about our latest promotion on our FreedomizerRadio.com website. Our chat client, Bark, B-A-R-C.com, is hosting a micro-Bitcoin giveaway while supplies last. All you have to do is go to FreedomizerRadio.com, join our chat room, create a screen name, and type to your friends and some micro-Bitcoins will fall from the sky. Not only that, the more people that are typing, there will be some random lotteries as well, so just for typing to your friends, you can earn some micro-Bitcoins. So who knows how long this will last, but join us now, FreedomizerRadio.com. problems with Common Core, I don't even have time to go into most of them, but a step in the right direction would be to give local communities, teachers, parents control over their schools so they can design curriculums and standards to best meet the needs of their students and get the federal government out of education. You are listening to Freedomizer Radio, where freedomizers freedomize freedom. Lindsay Williams on Freedomizer Radio. 
seems things are happening so fast now. And again, I want to thank you for the privilege of allowing me to be with your audience and with you tonight. Everyone out there in your listening audience, they should listen to you every single day. Don't you miss a program. Lord bless everybody set that spiritual house in order. It's the most important thing out there. Thank you, and good night. Okay, and we're back. Welcome back to the PM Show. This is your host, Mandy Parsons. Tonight I have Danica the Great and Ken the Liberty Phoenix with me, filling in for John, who is taking a temporary hiatus. I think I forced him to take at least a month off. Um, so that is uh, that is good for him. He needs it. No, he needs it because he is trying to become lucrative in his um, rodeo clown career. And that's that, not- you know, I spent a year as a rodeo clown. It was, that is a dangerous gig, you know, especially putting up the, on that makeup. If, if you don't know how to get that mascara on just right, you can stab yourself in the eye. And it's cool. <laughs> okay, well, just take it from you. Um, it is a dangerous profession. <laughs> now, yes, anybody because you could miss- encounter Pennywise the clown from it, and that's and that's really scary. Oh dear! Yes, the sharp thing. Yes, very very scary indeed. Eesh. Absolutely. So any- you have your inhaler, you're okay. <laughs> so anybody who misses the show tonight, or missed part of the show, or wants to listen later, you can always catch the show on Thursday nights on YouTube at the Voluntary Virtues Network from four to six Eastern. If you don't get to watch it when it's broadcasting. While it's scheduled, you can always look it up on YouTube with the PM Show, and you can catch up. And if you are on Facebook, find the PM Show and like our page. I always post the rebroadcast on the page after it broadcasts on Thursday. So there's lots of ways to catch up and listen. Uh, If you're listening to the show and you want to offer some thoughts, please feel free to call in. The number is 347-324-3704. Or go to freedomizerradio.com and hit the chat room tab over on the right side of the screen. Create a name and come keep us company in the chat room because right now it's just Liberty Phoenix and me. And we're so busy talking on the air that we don't get to talk in the chat room much. So make it worth our while. No, because it was at the end of the sentence. Oh, that was at the beginning. Well, uh, well, there must have been a run on setting. Yeah, it was a run on time. We'll, we'll just go with that because the best thing about knowing you is that you keep me on my toes grammatically, and that's one of my big deals. So kudos to you for that. And I'm just, I'm just, I'm silly and goofy. So whatever. <laughs> she, she's the cuteness of the show. And then, and, an, and an amazing cook as well. Wow. Oh, thank you very much, Ken. <laughs> and all, all week at uh, at Portsmouth, and said, oh my goodness, I was sitting next. to to the, her tent with Taryn Lupo and Brian Hagen uh, for several hours, a couple of few days a week of that week, and the, the smells would just waft over, and you know it would really make you want to be like, dang, why don't I have another three ounces of silver for this food? Oh, yeah, you were a judge in the uh, cooking cooking competition, and you were you were uh, you had been joking with me earlier today. So you were just like, "Oh, I'm going to be a judge," and I'm like, "No, you're That's not. You're kidding me." <laughs> <laughs> I only heard amazing yeah, things. That's one of the that's one of the best things to do at Pork Fest is be a judge of the uh, the one pot cook off because getting your meals in is one of the most important parts of Pork Fest, and with that one, you get. Uh, Almost free meal. It's like eight bucks, and you get to eat this huge, huge amount of food. It's amazing. Well, I will say this: I missed it this year. Um, I will be there next year because I have a new job coming up that is going to allow me to be there. So I will be expecting it. Very excited. Well, some people should expect me to visit before seeing them in New Hampshire. Well, well, I do intend to cook again uh, next Pork Fest, and I'm going to be investing in some uh, more cooking equipment. And I do have a couple of people that were interested in working for me, which is really awesome because if I can get people to work for me, I can produce more food. I can probably offer uh, better quality. You know, I would. You know, I thought my food was pretty well, but I was thinking I could probably offer more options. We can turn out food faster, and people will keep coming back. I will probably be the next mandrake of it. You know, I hope. He doesn't hear that and get all upset and stuff, but <laughs> I'm sure that there is talent abound on this chat right now between the three of us. 
So. Well, you know, I found myself having something to do several times. What do you uh, What do you think you'd be paying in an hour? Oh, um, let's. <laughs> what is, is there? Let's see. Is there a minimum wage at Portsmouth? <laughs> um, I would. I would offer probably more than minimum wage. Um, I'm not. I would probably have to ask Mandrick basically what he offered his employees. I would probably offer maybe somewhere between eight and ten, um, and then if we have more people more turning out food, we'll probably start offering tips so they'll get tips on top of that. Plus, I would like to donate a portion of the tips to Free Aid as well because Free Aid does such a good job. They have amazing volunteers that stay up all hours of the night for all sorts of crazy, weird situations, and Ken knows what I'm talking about it's when I say that. Yeah, as I understand, he had a little issue with leaving his funds in somebody else's vehicle on his way to New Hampshire. Oh, you had an issue well, no, with free aid. Well, I was talking about free aid. Huh? Free aid helped me out. Uh, my, that oh, was, okay. That, no, I'm, I'm saying I had a, I, I got myself out of a jam with free aid. Uh, you helped me out pretty well. That's wonderful. That's good to hear. Now, speaking of adventures, you had an adventure the other day. I was actually kind of privy to, and I was just floored. And I think everybody else who hears the story will be floored as well. So tell us the story. I, I'm not going to add anything to it. I'm going to let you tell your story, so go for it. All right. Well, um, so and some some of you may or may not know, um, my vehicle was unable to be registered, I thought. Um, because the title was all screwed up. So when I took it, took it to the DMV, the woman basically told me, yeah, you have to commit fraud in order to get this transferred over. What? <laughs> and so, yeah, the uh, the only way that I could get it transferred over was to fake the the title and all kinds of other hoops to jump through, uh, fake the, the bill of sale and all kinds of stuff, which, I, which I'm not willing to do. And so... I was like, you know what, screw it. I'm just going to have to uh, drive my vehicle and figure out a way to get a new vehicle. We'll see how it, what, how it goes. And during that time, I started to develop this idea that, you know, you know what, whatever, I will just, I'm, I'm just not going to register, period, and uh, deal with the consequences as they come up. Well, I made it four and a half months without getting pulled over. I slapped some plates on there and just decided to drive around. Well, apparently, you know, my the plates only last for so long. The little stickers that you have to put in the corner are there, there that you know you have to pay your your tax to the to the king's men, and uh, and then they say that you have the ability to drive unmolested from one point to another with this nice little sticker on there, among others. Uh, that one expired on the plates that I had put on this vehicle, and so I eventually got pulled over uh, last weekend. At about 1 o'clock at night, it was not the best idea to go driving at 1 o'clock at night. I'm sorry, in the morning. Um, But I had to work in the morning, and I came outside to grab my vaporizer out of my van, and I realized, oh, crap, my ladder's not up there. I had left it at my last job for that day. So I decided, well, I'm going to have to go out there and uh, pick my stuff up. And I have to work in six hours, so off we go. Jump Jump in the van and... Down the road. I didn't make it more than two blocks before I saw some cherries pop on. And I just so happened to be in a uh, a Facebook group chat hangout with uh, Mandy and Hef and a couple of the other co-hosts from Unity Evolved. And I mentioned that, well, I was finally getting pulled over. And uh, everybody in the, the, the room was like, oh, no, what's going on? You know, so forth. Start recording it. Start recording it. And uh, the when I, when I first pulled over, you know, I'm I'm sitting there thinking, you know, he's got me. He's got me dead to rights. Um, there's nothing I can do. I've got plates on it from a different vehicle, expired. There's no registration. All I've got on this thing is insurance. Literally. The only thing I've got on it is insurance. And really, all you really should need to have on a vehicle is insurance. Well, we should note too, that you didn't do this with the intention of being an activist. You just did this because you were in dire straits at the time. 
Yeah, pretty much. But you know, a little, mm-hmm. a little halfway through, I was like, well, whatever. I'll, I'll relegate it to activism. And we'll say, sure, it's activism. Um, and you know, it 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 seems to make sense to do, and and it does still does make sense, and it does ring true to me. Um, but so the officer comes up and he takes my 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 driver's license and my insurance and walks back and checks my name for any warrants and everything, which I have none. And he runs the plates. And while he was back there checking it, that's when I started the uh, the recording. Um, you know, the the Bambuser app, when it records and it gets sent to sleep mode, the video puts off. And it's only, the entire video is like one and a half frames. But he comes back and he asks me, you know, is these are these for a Ford or a or a GMC? I'm like, well, no, those are for my other vehicle. Um, that's you know, that was the only way that I would be able to drive. It's the only way I'd be able to get to work because I put those other ones on there because I can't uh, can't get registered in my name. And I just illustrated the issues with my title and so forth. There. And he was a little incredulous. Um, he didn't really. He he was kind of surprised that that I would be driving it at all. Um, and I was wearing my fedora, my Liberty fedora, with my shiny badges all over it that have the uh, anarcho-capitalist, anarcho-socialist pin, my, my Bitcoin rebel pin, and I had a, a pin on there from Michael W. Dean, his hate, state speech is hate speech pin. And uh, the officers noticed those, and he started asking about them. And uh, when, when I pointed out the Bitcoin rebel Pin. He's like Bitcoin. What's what's Bitcoin? He's like you don't know what Bitcoin is. So I proceeded to uh, to educate this, this this law enforcement officer on the the great uses of Bitcoin, how it's a decentralized ledger, how you know it it it, it does for money what the internet did for human communications. It makes it instantaneous, and and we just started talking. And he had mentioned he had, he he went he went back and took the little Bitcoin thing. They came back uh, a few minutes later, and he, he, he was like, you know, do you know that this is a crime and so forth? And the first thing that came out of my mouth, out of my mouth, of course, is who's the victim? Uh, and I just kind of tried to gloss over it. I wasn't really trying to get on that whole subject of activism and the non-aggression principle and everything, but he just kept going back to it. So I, I grudgingly started to debate him about the, the virtues of a, of the non-aggression principle and whether or not. Uh, officers should be should have a monopoly on force, and and we just started talking about all this other stuff, other than the, the plates on my vehicle, and I basically you know told him that what he does is immoral, and he's uh, a tax collector for the for the state, and because of all that, I drove home. He told me just make sure that I take it back home and not to drive it anymore. And he let me go. He did. Wow. Yes. We're we're sitting here. We're listening to this conversation between him and the cop. He is in the first thing out of my mouth, really in a loud, wondering voice. Is he is giving the cop or teaching the cop the non-aggression principle? This, I said he's not good. I'm like, why isn't he going to jail? Why isn't he handcuffed at this point? No, he's teaching this cop about the non-aggression principle. He's teaching this cop about anarchy, and I was floored. And we're all sitting here going, no way, the audacity. He is teaching this cop the non-aggression principle. I I could never get away with that. I probably would be the one to like start crying in my car just because I was so upset. But yeah. no, no. Ten the Liberty Phoenix sits there and teaches the cop about the non-aggression principle. Yeah, there was uh, apparently some some debate as to whether or not it was whether or not it really happened um, because of the because it was only one screen and how it, apparently to someone it sounded scripted, uh, which I find extremely hilarious. Uh, somebody said that the cop sounded stoned, so it might have been staged as well. Um, but no, I I can guarantee you guys that that was real. 
Well, I mean, also, too, we were listening to it. Anybody who knows you well enough knows that you're not really good at lying, to my knowledge. I think that if you lie about something, you eventually come clean. But also your reactions afterwards, they didn't get to see the reactions that we did. You're sitting there trying to figure out what just happened, how did you get away with that, and how is it that you're sitting in your bedroom when you probably should have been locked up in handcuffs if the state well, no, had done what they usually do. should have when I completely plausibly could have because there's no should i shouldn't have, i shouldn't have even been stopped no i but said I when you should. when you should have according to the state that's what i said yes yes um so yeah so that was it was pretty amazing and you've told this story a few times now but there's no way we can have you on a show and not have you talk about <laughs> your experience just no yeah, way. I actually I actually plugged Davi Barker's book, Authoritarian Sociopathy. I started t- talking to him about the Milgram experiment, what how how that was done, and and when I when I um, when I mentioned the the Stanford Prison experiment, his eyes kind of lit up, and he was like, Yeah, yeah, I've 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 heard of that one. I've read about that one, and I'm like, Yep, that's where it was. This this officer already had this stuff in his head. He already knew what he was doing was wrong. That's why he was. That's why he sat there and and spoke to me for almost 25 minutes. That's why he let me go. That's why he didn't, you know, pull out his billy club and beat the living crap out of me. Uh, he knows already. He knew already. He just wanted to to, to you know have a decent Saturday night. Um, he was like, man, I'm working Saturday night. I might as well sit here and bullshit with this guy. He's pretty smart. I think I'm going to sit here and like actually learn something. He already, he already had it in the back of his head, in, a, in the back of his heart. I think that's why ultimately I got to go back home. Well, I will tell you this. You were also not rude to the cop. I think if you had tried something and you'd been rude and aggressive, it probably would have ended drastically different. You are absolutely correct about that. Yeah. So many people take it, unfortunately, and really just kind of, you know, oh, cops are brutalists. I'm going to show up in their faces. I'm going to be rude. And it's just like, okay, yes, some cops can be jerks, but you're not really spreading the message of peace and really driving the message home if you're going to act just like them. I mean, the, you know, the way to get through someone's head is through a, um, what's that, a, Oh, man, I'm going to be totally girl and be, okay, uh, a crowbar. Okay, you can spread the message by opening it up gently with a crowbar, or you can smash it into them very badly with a hammer and not get anywhere and break all the contents or inside you, while you're at it. Or you can smash them with said crowbar. You can use the crowbar gently, or you can use it aggressively. All right, this is cop talking about Mandy, not left for dead. <laughs> Yeah, Danica and I have some adventures on Left 4 Dead. Oh, what a game. What a game. Oh, you guys are still playing video games. Um, Yeah, you who says this, who just got Nintendo games sent to you in the mail. Those are classic. That does not count. Anything pre-PlayStation is not considered a video game per se. It's considered a classic arcade gaming system. But well, Ken, with you, all... have a, you get a cricket bat, and I use that to paddle Mandy into submission. It's so much fun. Oh, yeah. She's always chasing me going, paddle, 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 wait till we get to Pork Fest, paddle, paddle, paddle. Mm-hmm. And then I, and then everyone gets up and like, stop doing that. You're going to take away her health. I'm like, I took away one smidgen of her health. My goodness. But you have the paddle, and if I have a bat, then I just hit you back or even shoot you. So <laughs> right, you know, they're exactly. always like, you, you two need to knock that off. You're going to run out of health. And it just makes us crack up worse, and we just do it more. So it's awesome. <laughs> Then we just do the it's classic anarchy slash voluntarist, don't tell me what to do line. <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of fun when we're gaming. But speaking of cop stories, I saw another article. This comes from the Liberty Crier. Uh, Wisconsin Supreme Court has apparently decided that you're free to drive away if a cop knocks on your window and motions for you to roll it down. Which I found this interesting. So this story... Um, December 25th, 2011, so Christmas 2011, this gentleman, Daniel Daniel Vogt, I think is how you pronounce that, he was parked with the engine running in a parking lot in, a, in the village of Cassville. It was 2 a.m. It was 37 degrees. He had not done anything illegal, but the deputy thought it was suspicious that he was in the parking lot of the park that had closed at 11 p.m., so he stopped behind his car with the headlights on, but the red and blues weren't flashing. So he walked up to the car. 
he saw the driver it was Vogt and with his girlfriend Kimberly Russell in the passenger seat and he said he would have let Vogt go had he driven off because he had nothing to stop him for. But Vogt didn't drive off because he thought he wouldn't be able to do that without hitting the deputy with his vehicle. So he thought he had no choice but to comply. And when the window was down, the deputy smelled alcohol and noticed that Vogt's speech was slurred. So he got arrested for driving under the influence. And the court's majority argued that the initial interaction was voluntary. So now, if somebody lives through trying to use this, um, maybe they'll be able to win in court. But if somebody tries to do that, they're going to die. To drive off? Yes. That cop would just pull out his pistol and start firing on them. Well, oh, he rolled over my foot out of fear of, in fear of my life. Oh, and you're right. With an excuse like that, it's possible. But of course, according to the Supreme Court, if there is not a plausible reason that they're getting pulled over, they don't have to roll their window down. So what say you, Danica? Well, um, you know, the, the police here tend to be very, uh, how should I say this, um, very happy about pulling people over. I have not gotten pulled over since moving here, but I think I'm just going to have to uh, take that advice. I actually heard that advice from someone else from Cobb Block that you do not have to, you can just keep on driving, just kind of like, okay, well, if the guy is waving at you, he's just waving at you. You know, you, you know that does not mean that you should pull over, and many times you shouldn't. So, you know, I'm <laughs> thinking that, you know, under – you know, under the un- impression that I could very well get chased again, that I'm just going to have to do that. See, I was. Wouldn't that become felony charges, though? Evading, like, aiding the, like, evading a, an officer or something? I, I can just see that law becoming completely twisted around and used against the person that, that, uh, that tries to run away or tries to leave the scene. Or, you know, evading cop or resisting arrest. They have so much different phrase for different things people can do. It's ridiculous. It's kind of like, hey, if I do anything, I'm going to get charged with something. Well, I do have to say that the Supreme Court decision was a 5-2 to two ruling. And the uh, Justice David T. Prosser said for the majority, although we acknowledge that this is a close case, we conclude that a law enforcement officer's knock on a car window does not by itself constitute a show of authority sufficient to give rise to the belief in a reasonable person that the person is not free to leave. But, you know, and I thought at first, I was like, okay, cool, you know, a win for the people. But, no, Ken, I think you brought up a good point in the fact that they could just shoot the car's tires. They could just shoot the person and say, oh, I was in danger of my life. Okay, in danger of your life because you're shooting somebody that's getting away. Yeah, but how many people have either killed people or killed pets lately that have gotten clean off the hook because they, they had it was a danger to them? Record, record, I'd say. That's the only way to... Uh, Oh, I'm just saying that it's, you know, very important to record these instances, you know, keep everyone, keep everyone's integrity if they say they're going to do that, and it's caught on film that they didn't, well, what else have they been lying about? And you never know these days, you never know. Well, and you know, the, the, all these cops that are supposed to be having cameras on that are just malfunctioning. You know, it happens so often now, it's not even funny. They really should upgrade their, their equipment. But, you know, if, if they're going to upgrade their equipment, they're going to have to start bringing in more taxes or, for God, God, for, God forbid, pulling more people over. So if we want better recordings, then they need to steal more money from us. What do you think? Oh, so you're, you're asking the if the state, if the police should actually spend money on better recordings, is that what I'm understanding? Well, a little bit sarcastically, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm taking the devil's advocate's stance of it, but uh, that's essentially what I think they would say. They need to get well, that if, my tax, if you're still in my tax dollars, you might as well make use of it. Yeah. Sorry, Ken, yeah, I don't yeah, mean to cut you off. This would be... Go ahead. Oh, no, I was oh. apologizing for cutting you off. I think there's a delay, so I apologize. 
No, nah, there's no delay. I'm just overbearing. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> but I want to. I want to know what do you think? How do you think this this would be handled in uh, in the Libertopia? Um, and you know, libertarian paradise when we all have our own independence, when everybody owns themselves and is responsible for themselves. Um, do you think that there would be a toll for the person to sleep on somebody's street? You know, a if, toll if, if for them to sleep on the street. And pulled over onto your street. Oh, if he actually like, pulled over into my driveway. Well, I mean, if 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 you own the street in front of you, you know, and you've got you 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 purchase this nice chunk of 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 block. You know, you you take care of it. You got this guy sleeping there, uh, sleeping out his his intoxication. Would you would you charge him? Would you tell him, hey man, you gotta go. I don't want you here. You're a you're a safety hazard to my other to my neighbors and so forth. Well, if it were on my street, if I actually purchased the street myself and took care to weed it, make sure it was clean, I would actually just you know, as long as the guy was safely off the street enough that he wasn't hindering traffic, for example, like if he was you know, over far enough that the two lanes of traffic weren't obscured, um, I would just, I would applaud and be like, hey, I appreciate you taking responsibility to not drive while you are intoxicated. I only ask that, you know, when you do feel sober enough to drive that you do go ahead and go in good health and, you know, pass, you know, pass it on, so to speak, pass on the, uh, you know, pass on the peace message, pass on the Good Samaritan because the guy's not, you know, he's not, he's not putting people at risk. He is pulling away to make sure that that does not happen. Yes, I do own the road, but if he needs to use it in order to um, recover from, you know, his drunken shenanigans, I would be perfectly okay with that because, again, he, you know, the road is there to be used. I did pay for it, but if he is, you know, pulling aside and not hindering traffic and trying to make sure that he does not harm anybody, I say good on you, man, and I wish more people would understand that that's how it should be. You know, instead of street signs, I think we should have QR codes that go to a, a fundraising account in order to improve the street. Absolutely. I think that's a great idea. Don't have, let's not have I agree. Street, that's let's absolutely... not have speed limit. Let's have voluntary yeah. tax limits. Donations well, are perfect. Are you? Me too. <laughs> I'm listening to the QR code. There's nothing wrong with QR codes, Mandy. Gosh. Oh, that wasn't a sarcastic statement. That was that was legit. <laughs> but I like the idea of putting up a sign that says, "If you like what we do, or you have, you know, you want to contribute to the well-being of this interstate," because I that actually brings up a whole other um, thing. That's now that we're talking about, it, I can bring it up. But there, the street that I live off of um, goes between. It's it's really weird. So there's this huge forest that I live by. And when I get out of the complex, I have to go on this road for about three about three quarters to about half a mile to get to the to get to the main highway. And this road is laden with potholes. Like I specifically have to maneuver all over the road to make sure that I don't hit the potholes. And I just I can't imagine how expensive it must be to, you know, grind up concrete or dirt and I don't you know not sure what the not sure it's actual concrete or rocks or not but how hard can it be to grind that up and fill the potholes so that my tire doesn't get snatched by one of them and I have to blow out a tire it's just it's really frightening so if there what if there was an actual road society that was taking care of those and there was a way to donate I donate to that in a heartbeat because it's just like ah I want to be able to drive on the same side of the road and not have to you know, move over to the right a lot and risk hitting a tree or move over to the left a lot and risk hitting another car to avoid these stupid potholes. Hey, guys, I will tell you this. We have a caller from the 201 area code. I'm going to bring them on. Uh, caller from 201, you're on the air. Hey, what's going on? Uh, my name is Peter, a first-time uh, listener to this show. I've, I've listened to plenty of shows on Freedomizer before. I actually co-host the show on Sunday. Uh, called We Are Change. Um, how's everybody doing? Great. Thanks hey, for calling on. It's great to have another Freedom I member on the air. Thank you for calling in. Oh, you're welcome. So so I'm I'm planning a show um of my own. So I've been tuning in and listening to all of the other shows that have, that are on the Freedom Eyes Network. Um I'm a resident conservative. Um I'm 
uh, I tend to have it out with anarchists or libertarians sometimes on, on some issues. Uh, I noticed you guys were talking about, you know, the, the police and, um, you know, the, the specific topic where you can drive off if you're, uh, if a cop asks you to roll down your window and that's a law and I forget the state that you had mentioned. Um, but I, I, my, my thing is this, I, you know, we see this all the time where cops are, you know, performing a, in, in bad conduct or, or bad behavior and stuff. But I think we have to, at, at some point, realize that there is here for order and for protection. Um, and and I, I often have this debate with, with uh, anarchists and libertarians as to, you know, oh, all, all cops are bad because they're part of the system and, and you're just a statist. Um, what, where do you guys fall on the, on the lines of that? Like, I, you know, as far as cops being there for the protection uh, of the society as a whole or the collective um, versus or, 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 or are you on the other side of the paradigm where it's more like all cops are bad just because they're cops, the system is bad, yada, yada, yada. So I guess that's my question. I know, I know speaking from personal experience that things like, security guards, cops, et cetera, fall under the Tenth Amendment, which says that we give the power to these entities to keep us safe and provide services for us, and they've taken it and they've run with it, and they're now overpowered and have way too much power than we've allowed them to have, not speaking that a lot some of us on this program agree with the Constitution, but that's what the Tenth Amendment was set up for. As for cops, you know, I've heard the argument of people saying, oh, well, he's not one of the bad ones, he's one of the good ones. However, if you're on a police force and you know that there are people who are acting in, in um, against what their job detail is and they're doing corrupt things that go against the job description that they signed up for, and you're letting them do this and not standing up for, for what's right, does that still make you a cop? Just because you do things right and you help people, how are you helping people if you're not standing up to these people who are doing their jobs incorrectly and hurting the same society they're supposed to be protecting? Well, it's, I mean, that's that's interesting. I mean, and, and that's a fair fair case, but I think, you know, individual circumstances may uh, come into play with those specific things. But when we look at a police force, we have to understand the power is given from your sheriff. Um, most of your police are, are appointed um, or hired uh, based in, on your local municipality or township. Um, but your sheriff plays an important role because your sheriff is responsible for a county, but also if, if he, uh, he enacts the authority of what to actually enforce, what laws to enforce. So your sheriff should be constitutionally sound, um, you know, and, and, and we always have the power to elect or vote out uh, a, a sheriff. Uh, Dana Kara, can you guys have um, specific viewpoints on this? Let me ask you something. What is your definition of legitimate, of a legitimate authority? How would you define that? A legitimate authority. That's it, it, it's it's pretty interesting. Um, you know, I, I would suggest something that, that I guess it, to me it would mean something that's, that's an authority above me, uh, something that's constitutionally sound. Um, that, that is there to maintain order or, you know, some some form of order within the Constitution, uh, well, would you within the boundaries of the Constitution. Authority, would you consider your authority legitimate if it was not held accountable, if there was no accountability? Would you consider that a, a legitimate authority over yourself? Well, no, I, you know, you do have to have accountability. There's, there always has to be checks and balances in everything because... Every position in society could end okay, up would you, uh, you know, being uh, uh, consider an authority over you legitimate if they uh, if they if they were allowed to go against their word if they were uh, if, they was, if they said that they were here to serve and protect but all the other checks and balances around it say that they're not there for that if that was just a slogan kind of like a a corporate hashtag would you consider that legitimate? Well, no, no, I wouldn't consider that legitimate. So everything that I've just described to you applies to our police force. Um, nine, times out of, nine times out of ten, uh, when an officer, when a law enforcement officer steps out of their bounds, they're not. Um, the courts have, have already ruled that, the, uh, that police officers and law enforcement officers have no obligation whatsoever to protect you. 
So where's well, the legitimate authority there? I think it's, it's it's always easy to look back and and kind of you know we have to understand for one this is you know you you can't look at individual circumstances and make it collective, but we also have to individualize and look at the specific situations. Like you guys were talking before about oh well we could just drive off and and then somebody mentioned well that'll probably lead to you being dead. Um, you know I, I think uh, you know in the eyes or in the mindset of somebody in law enforcement I served in the military so. I have somewhat of that uh, of, of that mindset, I guess you could say. Um, you know, you're out there risking your life to protect others. And if you're, you know, psychologically, I mean, if you're not doing anything wrong, why why wouldn't you just stop and just have the cop ask you a couple questions? You know what I mean? Like, uh, if, if the extreme was, God forbid, you know what I mean, something can happen and, and, oh, my God, like, you know, somebody dies or whatever at the hands of the cop. Um, well, that's exactly what I actually debated with the officer in my recent uh, in my recent traffic stop was the fact that the only reason that I did stop was because I was under duress. Because if I didn't stop, then eventually he would have pointed a gun at me and pulled the trigger, or they would have pitted me. And he, he tried to say, "No, no, you're, you're talking about something that I haven't done," and so forth. I'm like, "No, but when you turn those cherries on, you're pointing a gun at me. Because if I don't obey, then you will use." Violence, up to and including the the, uh, the deadly force upon me to to enact my compliance, which that is uh, completely illegitimate. Um, you, you can't say, "Hey, stop!" or "I'm going to shoot you in the head," um, and think that that's legitimate. Um, so I don't think that there's any legitimate authority when it comes to police officers, because. Under your own definitions, they're illegitimate. Well, and no, I mean, you know, again, you, you cited specific questions, and I, I mean, I answered them um, as, as 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 specific as I possibly could um, within that, within a yes or no answer uh, specifically. Um, you know, if, if you're citing examples, I, you know, that's a different story. But it just seems like a lot of this anti-cop stuff is just coming from a fringe group of these anarchists or, or lib, uh, libertards, as I like to call them, <laughs> um, <laughs> that, uh, that that just they just feel like they have a problem with authority overall. So it's like it's like the troublemaker in class that now all of a sudden is an adult that's like, screw the government, I'm not listening to it. It doesn't work. I'm gonna do me. And that's what it feels like. Like sometimes uh, you know, and maybe I just I I, I don't get the whole anarchist kind of kind of theme, you know, and no government. and It just it hasn't worked in history ever. Um, and, it's not that there's no I, government. That's the problem that people he, think of when they hear of volunteerism. It's not a lack of a government. It is the lack of a centralized, forceful, monopolistic, uh, coercive government. You can govern well, people collectively well, without a centralized think- force. You can govern. Yeah, you, you, you can you can govern people without having a collectivized uh, government as well. But both of those, I think, fall under the umbrella of volunteerism and anarchism because you don't have that centralized force. Well, yes, but I mean, also, you you would also open up the doors for um, you know anarchism, like literally. I mean, it's the fact that you know, in no order. Um, you know, could you imagine if you had a anarchism dispute over no some milk? Order. That is not the definition of anarchism. Well, anarchism is a, the lack of a central government. That's it. Okay. Again, chaos uh, is in no order. And chaos does not equal anarchy. All right, all right. So let me let me choose my words a little bit more carefully next time. So let's say chaos. But you know, I mean, we could without the police force, without a centralized government. We could literally see like shootouts over a gallon of milk. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, you know, there, there's you can see there that has to now be some form of government. Yeah, but can you imagine? Could, but could you imagine without the fact that somebody could just walk into your house and just take what they want and just leave with it by force? Um, you see, that's so, where you have property rights um, and you know who, personal who would be there responsibility. To enforce because I own my body, so I have right? the right to defend myself and my property. It's my responsibility to defend that things. So if if I want to leave my door open and not care if somebody walks in and steals something from me, well that's a different that's a different issue. But if if I expect 
someone to respect my property rights, and I'm going to respect their property rights. And if I don't, then they have every right to defend their property with up to and including deadly force. So now, I would, I would have nine to times force... out of ten, you not have to do that because most people will govern themselves. Most people, human nature is adaptive. Right, human nature is not is neither good nor evil. Human nature is adaptive, which means that if people are put into a position where they will flourish by being by taking positive actions, that's what they will do. If they're put into a position where they will flourish by taking negative and evil actions, that's what they'll do. Now, if you create a society around um, reinforcing positive actions, you're not going to have as many as many sociopaths and psychopaths in that society. Because it's not going to be there's there's not going to be a breeding ground for it. Can I ask you a question? Has, so I don't believe we ever that had... we can achieve a voluntary society overnight. Like I don't want them to just automatically. Oh my God! There's no more government. There would be chaos because the people that live in this society right now would lose their freaking minds. Well, all right. I mean, if, if, that's if, not if, to if say that that's not key. an impossibility. Have all right. I, I, I guess I guess my thing would be that historically, has there any ever been any form of anarchist government? Is there any anyone in existence um, that we could point to that's bigger than a commune or um, a small town uh, that functions without um, any form of centralized government? Because until then, basically what we're going on is utter fantasies and, and unproven theories. Well, I would submit to you the Rainbow Gatherings and Pork Fest, but I would also uh, submit to you the fact that with huge governments, you have huge um, powers, and that and I consider a, a city of fifty thousand people a huge government. It's a heck of a lot bigger than my my single government of myself. So I don't want there to be huge uh, um, huge towns and cities and so forth. I think that would have a breeding place for apathy and sociopathy. I think people do better in smaller, tight knit communities such as the Rainbow Gatherings and Pork Fest. But if you were to have a huge metropolis spring out of a, a, a voluntarist society, I think over time and over, and this is, remember, we're talking generations here, uh, it would manage to exist um, with you know, a, a very negligible amount of violence because I don't think um, so, mankind is, you know, uh, naturally I, evil. I, I, I guess the point I'm just trying to get at is that it's it's this is all theoretical because we we do not or have not had a society based on that type of thinking ever in on Earth. So in order for you know it, you know it, it's 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 like wishful thinking almost in a sense because you know the the reality is is that and I agree with you on on making things smaller. Because I'm a conservative, I'm a huge smaller government guy. Um, I think we can we can work on levels as far as you know uh, taking some power away from the states, restoring some municipal uh, powers to individual cities, um, things like education, things like housing and development. Those types of things are best done at the at the smallest level possible. Uh, but but to say that you know uh, uh, getting rid of a central government, I, I think that. That's very, very silly. I, I, you know, only I, because I, you know, I'll go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say, I just love this as a conversation always because people are like, oh, that's never going to work. When do we have examples where this has worked? Uh, the, the fact is we don't have any examples because we haven't even tried it. Yet the same things that we keep on trying over and over again, they are not working, and yet people always go back to that. Well, this is what we should do because – this is what we're doing, and it's failing. But I know that this will still work because it's something. But then we're we had, you know, the, uh, the society, human societies had small governance. Um, you know, look at look at America, 265 years ago. It was small, tightly knit governments, but we had a centralized, coercive monopoly on force and violence in this geographical area that rose to power and will always rise to power over everyone else. So you can go back to constitutional times, but 265 years later, it's going to be back to where it is now because you have a society that fosters psychopathy and sociopathy. And that's just the way it is. If we don't stop uh, creating these breeding grounds for evil, then 
evil will never stop triumphing over over the, the good men who are pretty much just the majority that do nothing. Well, I'm going to tell you guys, we, ahead, we do need to go to a break. Um, I thank you for calling in. Um, we're going to go ahead and take our break really quickly. And when we get back, I think we're going to change the subject. But please, feel free to call in any time, and it was great to have you on. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Okay, and we're going to take a break. We'll be right back. Greetings, this is Blake the Eccentric, and I want to invite you to check out my new show on Freedomizer Radio, The Eccentric Perspective. It's sort of a red pill, blue pill, going down the rabbit hole kind of show, featuring outside-the-box politics, philosophy, and gonzo journalism. But be warned, with knowledge comes responsibility, and you might not see the world the same way again. As I will attempt to open your mind, speak to your common sense, and challenge your critical thinking skills. So please join me Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday from noon to 1.30 Pacific Time. Once again, that's Eccentric Perspective, only on Freedomizer Radio. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations, a new world order, a world with the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of men. Over my dead body, join Podcast 13 every Sunday at 10.30 Eastern Standard Time, 7.30 Pacific, only on Freedomizer Radio. Hey, Freedom S, join me, Proof Negative, weeknights, 9 p.m. to midnight Eastern, 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. Pacific, as we fight the new world order together, right here on Freedomizer Radio, your exclusive home of the Proof Negative show. Okay, and we're back from that commercial break. I do want to thank our last caller. Caller, thank you so much for listening and for adding your insight and your opinions. You're welcome anytime on our show. I do want to switch gears a little bit. I do want to remind everybody that the Proof Negative show will be coming up next. I'm his Tuesday night co-host, so if you're wondering if you've heard me before and you listen to us a lot, yes, you have, plenty of times. Um, it will be on, I always have to do this mental thing with the hours. So if it's 9 to 12 Eastern, it is 6 to 9 Pacific. So it will be on 6 to 9 Pacific right after this show. Uh, that is the Proof Negative show, so it's coming up next now. Um, since I do have one male guest co-host and one female guest co-host, both who are brilliantly minded, I might add, I have an article that I pulled up, and the title of the article says, Ladies, the smarter you are, the more likely you are to be single. Okay, I I was on a show several months ago as a co-host on Friday nights, and this conversation actually came up. Uh, I felt like, as a very intelligent female, that it was harder for me to meet people who were quote-unquote on the same level. And Danica, you're very intelligent, and I want the opinions. Share your opinions, Mr. Liberty Phoenix. What do you think about this? Um. Well, I'm not a woman, so I wouldn't really know. Not fully, anyways. But I think that uh, <laughs> that anybody who is intelligent will have trouble finding a partner, um, whether they're male or female, because you tend not to want to settle for somebody who's not going to stimulate you, um, intelli- you know, intellectually. Absolutely. Yeah, Inter- yeah. Go ahead. I just say you're a smart female, Danica, and I know that you're involved with somebody, I'm talking to somebody, and which was a drastically different story from four to five months ago. Um, I actually had been talking to Liberty Phoenix for a while now, and I think one of the best things I appreciate about that is that he challenges me mentally, but also he appreciates my intelligence. Do you come across anything with your significant other uh, about this? Well, yeah, we um, actually talk frequently together, um, you know, about things, you know, things that arise in the media, the wars that are going on. We constantly talk about several different types of conversations and subjects, and I, I agree, it definitely is important to me and a partner to be able to 
you know, pull that person aside and be like, hey, this is really bothering me, and I can't really find anyone that meets my view about this. And, you know, meeting someone in the community is great because most of the time you already have very um, very similar ideologies. I mean, he also is a voluntarist anarchist such as myself. Um, we have a lot of the same viewpoints when it comes to that kind of thing. We have a lot of the same opinions about um, war and such. Uh, there, You know, that being said, we don't always agree on everything. In fact, I remember specifically, and this is actually kind of a very silly thing. I'm just going to bring it up because it'll just show just how silly it can get sometimes. We got into a uh, argument slash debate about whether or not anime and cartoons are the same thing, and I am of the opinion that they are not the same thing. He says they are. I mean, I'm not going to go into specific details, but I mean, you know, not only can we talk about very serious things such as politics, such as the government collapsing, such as the war, we can also talk about really, really goofy things. We talk about anything from, you know, again, arguing about cartoons to TV shows to <laughs> uh, chasing, you know, chasing each other to see who gets the bathroom first. Like, it's just, it's very important to find somebody who can. Um, make you laugh and make you smile, and, but is also able to discuss the same things. I remember specifically there was a guy I did very, very briefly years ago that he was a mechanic. And I, lo- and I love cars, too. I love talking about cars. But every single conversation we would have would go somewhere back to cars. And I'm like, okay, this is not really appropriate. I'm here I am talking to you about you know, the economy ca- crashing, you know, people possibly losing their job, and then you just equate it back to some Chrysler you worked on. It's like, come on. It was just, it was very awkward. Needless to say, that did not last very long. Hello? Hello? Okay, Danica, are you there? Yes, I'm here. (laughs) I don't know what happened. Okay, well, apparently it might have been on my end. I'm not sure how long we were talking um, without me being there. I have no idea what happened. That was on Freedomizer's end, apparently. Um, But we were talking about intelligent women. Tell me your experiences with being an intelligent woman and trying to find a significant other. Well, what part did I cut off on? I don't remember because I was going on and on. (laughs) Oh, okay. (laughs) Um, You know, how should I say this? For me, for myself, it has not been hard finding men. I mean, I, I mean, I'm going to be perfectly honest. If I'm single, I usually don't stay single for very long because just I attract very different kinds of men because of my interests. I am a gamer. um, I am a car enthusiast. I am a uh, freedom person. So that attracts men. All over the um, all over the paradigm, uh, finding a very good quality partner has definitely been a bit of a struggle for me. I've obviously had um, some issues with relationships in the past because it just one thing just didn't add up. But the, the you know my current partner is just absolutely awesome because he and I are able to talk about very serious things just pretty much on the drop of a hat. Like he'll say hey, this is what's concerning me, and he'll talk about, you know, maybe he'll talk about the war, maybe he'll talk about Bitcoin, um, he'll talk about you know, his current job situation, and I'm able to do that very easily with him, and it's very easy to have a very good conversation. So the first thing with partners is that you have to be able to communicate um, effectively. You know, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be on a very serious subject, but you have to be comfortable talking about any subject and be able to communicate your feelings um, across. So I am very happy to have that as my partner. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree. I would much rather have a man who can keep me mentally stimulated for hours than to sit there and have somebody just based on on how they look. Um, You know, you can have that all day long, but I think the old adage proves true that those people will lose their looks at the end of the day, and then what are you left with? And I just look at women. I mean, we take off and put on different kinds of faces all day. Absolutely. Now, did I hear correctly? Do we have Ken back? Okay. Yeah, we had a little bit of problems on our end. Apparently, it was our system that failed, but I didn't get any notifications or anything. So I think it was on Freedomizer's end. But you were saying about women, about relationships. What were you saying? Me or... Yeah, yeah, you. Um, I completely lost my 
shack and thought he uh, apparently the landlord needed his rent money. <laughs> they do. Um, they do require that. Yes. Yeah, it's generally. Um, in regards to our, like I said, I, I think basically I don't think it, it makes a difference whether it's male or female. If you're intelligent, you're going to have a hard time finding a finding somebody to stimulate you. Um, is it is it more prevalent for for women? I'm sure, mainly because societally, uh, men are viewed as the dominant sex. Um, but I think that's really just an illusion. And generally, women are the ones that control all the all the cards. But men tend to have an easier time of handling their uh, their self esteem. So I think they would have they would they would find it easier to compensate for that lack of intelligence. Um, if they had the, the, the self-esteem to, to overcome it, um, I think that's easier for them to deal with than, than it is for one person. Yeah, there was an, in this article I'm reading, there was an article in the publication called The Wire. Financial reporter John Carney says that one explanation for this phenomenon is that some uh, successful men date less successful women, not because they want women to be dumb, but rather because they want someone who prioritizes their life in a way that's compatible with how you prioritize yours. So basically they want someone who isn't ever going to let her career get in the way before making dinner and pleasing them. Well, hey, if that's what he wants, I'll do I mean, he's probably not going to have as fulfilling, as emotionally fulfilling as a relationship, but whatever. You know, it's like you said, I, I had to go through a lot of people before you and I started talking, and that's one of the things that I've quoted the most, that I'm really glad you're intelligent because you keep me mentally stimulated. Well, I appreciate the compliment. I usually find myself Joel and, and spouting out a bunch of BS. Oh, certainly not. No, no, no. You keep me on my toes. And I know Danica's man, so I know he keeps her on, on the toes also. Yeah, you know, you really you can't um you know, you when once you start to get to know him it's just it's very impossible to not just be just be driven by him. either you know you might get really mad at him or you might laugh at him or you might completely agree with him. Sometimes you know he does you know he does tend to you know annoy you know annoy and upset a lot of people, but most of the time he is right in a lot of what he's saying, but you know, I just tell him that sometimes. <laughs> Well, guys, we have 60 seconds left. I'm going to go ahead and close out the show with a song from our good friend Harry Gray called There is Love. Um, Please stay tuned next for the Proof Negative show. And you guys, please listen in next week. Thank you, Danica. Thank you, Ken. And we'll talk to you both next week. Bye.